our next speaker is Raleen Lowther and Anne Zussman. Raleen Lowther is an associate professor of the game Art, Animation, and Simulation Design at Southern Arkansas University, and she's worked for 10 years as an artist in the video game industry before becoming an educator. Raleen teaches 3D modeling and 2D and 3D animation and creates artworks in both digital and traditional media. This talk is basically going to have about a uh, sort of foundation of a real world experiences and the workshop will provide a variety of natural artifacts that will serve as a starting point for participants artistic explorations. Raleen Lowther and Anne Zussman uh, recently completed a collaborative art project called Quotidian Moments through different lenses where they created different interpretations of shared visual experiences. Their talks, uh, th their walks in rural Arkansas was a source of these experiences and during which they took photos, videos, and occasionally audio recordings of their observations. Uh, these became part of their inspiration and prepared preparatory processes for the final works, which took a variety of forms, including watercolor, acrylic paintings, digital drawings, and 3D models. Uh, while I would be able to talk more about this, I think I'd rather give it to the presenters. All right, well, thank you so much for having us here, and thank you everybody who is here with us today. So uh, Raylene and I walk together um, most days of the week and uh, we walk around Farm Road. We live in Magnolia, Arkansas, where we teach at Southern Arkansas University. We walk around Farm Road. It's a very pretty road. There are all kinds of interesting things that we see every day. And um, one, uh, about a year and a half ago, we decided to work together on a project where we would uh, see something that we were both interested in, something that excited our imaginations, and each of us would create an artwork based on that subject. Uh, however, because our styles are so different, the artworks came out very different as well. And that was actually one of the things that we found most interesting, is that observation and um, experience all work together. Uh, to create um, vastly different forms. And so uh, these are some examples of just a few of the works on the left. We have the photograph um, of one of the experiences and then um, the next two are artworks created from, um, from that experience. And some were um, benign, and some were a little uh, odd, but the uh, inspiration for what came out of that um, was was what was interesting to us. And Oh, do you want to start yeah. there? Yeah, uh, well, uh, and we had a show uh, with this body of work. Each of us had 12 pieces uh, of work, as well as we had some guest artists. We had it exhibited in uh, Brinson Art Gallery at SAU, and uh, we'll have it exhibited uh, at Texarkana Arts Council um, next, uh, next fall. So... Aside from the fact that we found inspiration from this, one of the things that we also already recognized in our own work but just got expounded on was the realization of how important it is to have experiences outside of the gaming world when making work for games um, or outside of film, outside of books outside of other people's interpretations of um, the world. While those are interesting, we all love them, it is also incredibly valuable to bring your own lived experiences into the development to create interesting work. So uh, we have a few examples of designers and artists who um, also feel that same value. For example, um, uh, Shigeru uh, Miyamoto, most of you involved in games probably are familiar with who that is, uh, the founder of Nintendo and the designer of Pokemon, um, says that he wants to hire people who are more likely to create new kinds of play rather than merely aiming to perfect current 
ones. Um, specifically, he said, I always look for designers who aren't super passionate game fans. I make it a point to ensure they're not just a gamer, but they also have a lot of different interests and skill sets. Um, because, again, bringing those interests into the game world and finding new ways of, of creating is what he did as well. So Pokemon came out of his love of collecting bugs as a child that then got translated into uh, this worldwide phenomenon. And uh, Felicity Hamos is a character designer for several Wes Anderson's movies, as well as many others. And she often finds inspiration from the real world, from things that she sees. You can easily see it in the fantastic flute bird that you see uh, on the right here. And here is a quote by her. I try to be inspired by things outside my field because quite often looking at the work of other illustrators only leads to self-deprecation and terrible doubts about my own legitimacy. Instead, I look at things in art or nature which fill me with ideas and excitement. And I feel that one of the things that looking at nature does, looking at the world around us, not necessarily nature, whatever is around you, like the cityscapes, people, etc., it gives you something real to reflect on. So if you are an artist, your art doesn't become secondary. So uh, it's not just repetition of something that was already created, but something that's truly original. Uh, another example is a concept artist, uh, Jared Morantz, and he has worked on film and games. Um, and he said that a well-designed creature, he does specifically creature design, a well-designed creature, no matter how unearthly, draws inspiration from its earthly counterparts. Creature design is the combination of familiar elements. You'd think you could do almost anything, but if you do, the creature isn't relatable. And that is one of the most important points out of using direct observation along with the fantastical is to ground it in reality enough so that we buy into the, the idea. And these are, this is an example of a creature design that um, he created that drew from um, a whole range of inspiration, including hippopotamus and squid and elephants, bringing all of those things together um, into this fantasy creature that we can believe might actually exist, as terrible as it might be, um, it could really exist. So one of the things that Raylene and I both started doing in our teaching is a project that we call Real Experiences. So to backtrack a little bit, when we uh, started working on our series together based on things that we saw in our walks, we both discovered that we uh, no longer had to deal with artist block. If anything, it's almost like we have too many ideas that we don't have time uh, to get out there. So uh, we decided to introduce this project into our classes and students have to collect photographs, videos, or notes about interesting things that they see in their daily life that could possibly serve as an inspiration in their artwork. And so there is a whole range of things in art or in game design um, that can be influenced by these kinds of um, daily observations or real world observations. Um, for instance, lighting. Um, because we walk most of the time on the same um, path and some of the people here who are from Magnolia recognize some of the, most of these photographs and definitely this location. So this is a duck pond um, on the Southern Arkansas University campus and we walk by it almost every day. Um, but depending on the time of day, um, the time of year, just the weather conditions, all of those things drastically change the way that this particular area looks and feels. So we have here an example of a bright sunny day versus um, an early morning full of fog 
um, kind of winter morning and the kind of mood that that creates would completely change gameplay. It would completely change the look and feel of a game and, and understanding that is vitally important to creating the mood that you might want for a game. Oh. And those are from the same spot. Yeah, and th these are, yeah, I should have flipped through here a little faster, sorry. Uh, these are from the exact same spot, that same duck pond. So we have four examples of drastically different moods set by lighting, drastically different color palettes set by lighting as well. Um, yeah. Uh, these are two, uh, this is the same cityscape in drastically different lighting. So when you look at the one on uh, the left there, how would you describe the mood? Like what is the feel of that for you? Warm? How would you feel like walking there? Scary? A little unpleasant maybe? Yeah, okay. How about the right one? Happy? The, this one here, here, you think you feel happy? Okay, okay. And maybe com a little more comfortable for sure, right? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have an eerie red glow there. Uh, and again, as you game developers and artists thinking about how color affects mood and how color affects the scene, there's building the world and then there's lighting the world um, are important things to consider. Um, so with that in mind is, is the idea of world building. So we talked about how lighting can affect mood, um, but also daily observations or observations of the world around you uh, should and can impact the way you design the worlds that you create. So if you are thinking of games and how you want to build a game, um, pulling from the world to create that, even if you have a directive, even if you have a theme. For instance, these two examples we have here would be great for a dystopian world. You know, it's really, really, really easy to look at existing dystopic games and dysty uh, existing dystopic films to create your dystopia, to create your, your world that's falling apart after an apocalyptic event. Um, but you can also create maybe a new kind of, a new vision of what that falling apart world could be by pulling from examples that you have around you. Instead of it being um, everyone else's version of what New York would look like, if you are, are here um, in Tulsa, why not look around Tulsa for examples of existing buildings and existing buildings that are already falling apart? And then what more could you, could you push that idea of what it looks like falling apart into um, the kind of event that created that apocalypse? Uh, pushing it, you can definitely take this and push it further. So uh, here on the left, there are some crawfish towers. So where we live, there are a lot of crawfish and apparently they build these uh, towers. And sometimes the towers are really close together. Sometimes they're sort of further apart and occasionally there is like a single tower away from all the others. So we were thinking that, you know, it's like living in the city, living in the suburb, and then a loner who just wants to get away from everybody. And they would build like their own personal private tower with a single entrance and not let anybody in. And, you know, um, so that could definitely be a jump off from creating a concept work of different kinds of buildings or different kinds of worlds. And so along with that, um, Another idea of, a wor of world building that Anna and I had was um, this creature here photographed on the, on the right. When Anna first found this and photographed it, neither of us actually knew what it was. Should we? Maybe. We didn't. <laughs> so we started creating this fantastical world. Um, as we were walking, we, we spun a story of, of world building where this was kind of, it looked like little teeth 
connected together with, with legs. So we imagined this world where this was the real tooth fairy, that as children's teeth fall out, um, they become sentient and grow legs and become the monster under the bed for little children. You could hear it scurrying around. But um, because they were so small, they couldn't really be... Uh, be seen if a parent did come to try to find that monster they couldn't be seen because it's a little tooth um, but as more teeth fall out they they become part of this creature and then over time it becomes um, a companion to the pair to the person even though the person wouldn't know that um, it becomes almost a guardian character for uh, for people and so eventually we did find out it's just the dead skeleton of a centipede but before that <laughs> we we came up with an, a whole elaborate story for it so uh, one of the classes I teach at SAU is concept art and uh, this particular year students were uh, you know having uh, to do real experiences every week and for their final project they had to create a story a whole world based on uh, one or several of their real experiences so i'm going going to show you a couple of examples what students have done this one right here is by Brittany header so on the left you're seeing her mood board by a story uh, for for the story that she wrote and that's not a mouse oh so. that's not a mouse okay this is a mouse okay so this right here is the real experience that she had. She saw a sky, and in the middle, it looked like somebody was trying to erase it. So from that came a really interesting story where this is an afterlife, where Bob Ross lives on and continues painting. There he is on the right as a character. And there is an evil pencil, an evil pencil who wants to take away the glory, who tries to erase what Bob Ross does, who scrolls indecent remarks on his artwork, and then they find out that an art critic bird is going to visit the afterlife, and uh, the, pens the evil pencil wants to wreak as much havoc as possible. Uh, the next one here is actually by Alison Wood, who is sitting right here. Can wave her hand? There yeah. she is. There she is. Uh, and right here, you can see her real experience. Inside, it's very warm colors. Outside, it's cool colors. This is a mood board. And she created this fascinating world where there is a spirit world and a real world, uh, and uh, characters move between them. And the spirit world is uh, warm colors, and the real world is cool colors. And on the right, you see one of the main characters from that story. Uh, so there's world building. There's, there's lighting considerations, character design, um, and character story uh, is another really big area of concept art and um, game development that can come from the, these kinds of experiences. And um, I'll let Anna describe kind of what she saw happening with the uh, dragonfly. So with a dragonfly, something I, I never knew before I saw that is apparently, may, maybe you guys knew that, but apparently, uh, you know, the dew falls on them like it does on absolutely everything. And because of that heavy dew, for a while they can't fly. So this dragonfly flew away a little while after once its wings dried, but it was just this really beautiful texture. And I thought that could be something, you know, for a flying character, maybe it, there is a po point when maybe they can't fly for such a reason. Alternatively, I think just the texture of the wings with drops on them is really beautiful and could serve as an inspiration for an outfit for a character. Uh, and then in, co in contrast to that, something like a squirrel, which we've all seen, whether we live in a rural area or a city area, we're all 
surrounded by these squirrels. So using them as inspiration for character movement, um, for animation, um, or for the design, the, the, the kind of rounded, fluffy feel that feels, even though they're not really approachable, they feel approachable because of how round they are. Those kinds of, that kind of shape language um, is really important in game development for reading what the character is doing, um, as well as just the oddness of the size of the, the nut <laughs> in the squirrel's mouth. And we've seen this so often, these, these squirrels like try to, to take on something that is way too big for them and they kind of struggle with it initially and um, and using that in kind of the character's backstory uh, as well as the character design um, could be something interesting with this. Uh, so this is some images that uh, I, uh, I saw when I was in New York City and when I was showing Raylene one on the right right here, uh, she said that to her this character sitting in that red cart because the color of his outfit was very similar to that of a cart that it looked kind of like a cyborg character like part mechanical, part human and I thought that was really uh, interesting. Um, and just really quickly looking at, so we've been talking about looking at nature, looking at architecture, looking at lighting, but looking at people and all the people around you for character inspiration it, and for animation inspiration is really, really valuable. How do people walk? How do they run? How do they sit? Um, how are they reacting to um, conversations as well as um, the sh coming up with more interesting shapes and forms for people than the standard generic video game character. References a little bit just briefly back to one of the earlier talks today about increasing diversity in games. Well, how can we do that? By having people in, on the dev teams with diversity, but also paying attention to what's around us. Don't just draw what every other game has but actually see who we have around us and start drawing from that literally in our drawings um, and helping that to inspire our characters will start to increase some of the diversity we see in games. And actually to add a little bit to that is one of the great ways of creating excellent characters is well, like what Raylene said, looking at people around you, think of yourself as a director. And all of you know quite a few people. Some of, you are, some of them are close to you, some of them are not very close to you, but you, know, you see them quite a bit. So think of yourself as a director who is choosing a perfect cast for the play. Who would make you know, a good villain? Do you know a good villain in your life? Like maybe a, you know, a bully in middle school or whatnot? <laughs> well, this is your chance to get even. <laughs> Uh, so we oftentimes, you know, look at these interesting, you know, since, since we live in rural area, animals, birds, insects, and think of them as characters. So uh, on the left, uh, there is a blue dragonfly that we saw. Initially, we thought that it was dead. It was sitting on a huge ant hill. We assumed that ants killed it and it was just there, a shell of it. Well, apparently it was alive. It was just a thrill seeker. Um, and I decided to do this, you know, and dashing officer was kind of a thrill seeker as well, like just looking for danger all the time. Uh, the one on the right is just there was this crow who like had its mouth open, who seemed to be like hectoring, like lecturing somebody incessantly, and they just started playing with that. Uh, here is another one. We saw this dead bird who looked sort of very haughty, kind of all that. Um, so here, here is a character based on that. Uh, so we've, we've touched on a few key areas we wanted to um, point out, just a few more areas to consider that could be um, benefited by being more observant and adding some of those observations into your designs. Um, so we, we talked about lighting, but texture creation for your game objects. Um, world building, but behavior and motion or movement for your animations. Uh, 
character design, outfit design. Believability and specificity is one of actually the most important reasons why we see the importance of observation being incorporated into uh, game design and into uh, concept art design is because there is this often a lack of specificity in what we see coming out of students initially as their first learning is they, there's this really generic, overly clean worlds that are drawn and modeled and designed and developed. And so having, having a, a observed the world around you, you can start adding some of those specific details that make it believable. Um, yeah, sorry. No, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Did you want nope. to? Okay. All right, so uh, this is time for a workshop where all of you are going to have a real experience because real experience doesn't have to be something far away. It could be something very close. So we're all going to step out for five minutes. We're just going to step out right outside here on this floor, and we're going to look at some things that are available there for and us And we know to that see. we're live streaming, so those of you who are live streaming, look around where you're at for five minutes and come back here um, and or stay where you're at, but uh, you can observe where you're at. We will be coming back here and talking about that in five minutes. And feel free to take photos or notes on your phone or anything else if it helps you. We're, we're not going outside. Oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're inside. Okay. We're right here. I'm going to draw something. I'm going to draw like a character based on the songs that helps me. Awesome. Very cool. So, I know. there are so many things here to look at. There are all kinds of cool textures. Uh, there is a pretty unusual view when you look down. You normally don't see from so high above. You can look around you. Actually, if there are some people you don't know, you could make them care. <laughs> um, the light, it's, uh, you know, interesting light. As we have the light from um, the what are they? What are they? From the skylights. So th that's a bit unusual. We also have the lights from the interior lighting. So look around. Minutes. Also on the side, we have a bunch of nature samples. If you wanted to take a look at later. So spend a couple of minutes, walk around, see if anything strikes your fancy, and then come back. I already I'm gonna make like a character based on my pin. Oh excellent. So what is it gonna do? I don't it's just I think it's just gonna be like a character. Just do it. Okay, okay. It's my friend and look good. Should have gone better than I thought. They stayed on task. I want to draw some I took pictures of some of the art it's so it's just so cool. It is so cool. Yes. What? Oh. Nice. Yeah. That is. That's a cool pattern. That is very cool. Oh my gosh, that is. Very it's cool. like they cleaned it, but didn't. Oh yeah. The wall. <laughs> okay. Well, I actually do want to take a picture of that because it's both disgusting and cool. You know, this is kind of if, you know, where we have portraits of people, we have photographs, but there could be also like, I don't know, you know, like to flatten the person between some things to stay forever. Oh, what? Oh, interesting. Just the difference in lighting and the fact that it's open and then comes into this, this hallway. It's like walking into yeah. another dimension. Yeah. yeah. That would be, see, know, that would be cool. Where you clip into rooms. It's kind of video game related. Uh, like it's, this, it's this thing where there's this really uncanny like room and stuff and you clip through a wall or clip through the floor and it's like really scary but so, so basically, bugs in oh, I, games I that you. 
but you, yeah, kind of like, kind of like that, but it's like we have this reality, and then you clip into the back room, and it's, it's like this an alternate dimension game. with like these creepy, weird, the oh, like twilight. Oh, that, that is so cool. Wow. wow, that's really cool. Yeah, but it's, I think if we've talked about it. Yeah, we class, talked about yeah. it in class. But here, you know, what I was thinking is like you go into the building that's it's like perfectly normal and welcoming, and then actually it's a hospital where they create some sort of vicious experiments. Yeah. All right, we probably should be getting back shortly. I hope everybody got somebody. I mean, something, some experience. <laughs> so if you didn't get anything on the right on the table there, uh, there are a bunch of objects that you're welcome to take and observe and look at and put back afterwards. So what's next? So uh, hopefully you all found something interesting uh, that you observed. Um, and uh, as was pointed out to me, the mics were still on. I had kind of forgotten about that, so hopefully I didn't say anything too odd. Uh, but ho hopefully, if you did, it did hear any of that, it was just we were talking about some of the things we were observing and some of the things that could be taken from those observations. So like um, hallways that felt like a, a sudden shift in um, temperature and, and feel um, or or the railings as of the bike, the bike racks looking at them from from up above, uh, um, and how they take on a whole new pattern or a whole new form when seen from that far away and from such a different perspective. So it's just that shift in perspective. Those are the kinds of things that could um, impact game design and world building, and that's one thing we didn't even list on our list up here was game design too. What are some of the game mechanics that could come out of, uh, out of the shift of, in observation and how we, how we see and experience the world? But with that said, um, it, hopefully you have at least mental notes, possibly photos um, or video or audio recordings to, from which to draw. Um, and then we're going to ask you to think about those. So from your real experience today, um, does it remind you of anything? So you, you now had that, those things you noticed. Now take that, that observation and take it a step further and start thinking about how it applies to design, how it applies to characters, how it applies to um, environments and props. Um, so we're going to take a minute here for you guys to talk. So I'm not just asking this as a rhetorical question. What are some things you saw and what are some, obs what are some things that, that those things you saw reminded you of? And have you already started in your head thinking of ways you could take what you saw and jump it into a character design or a world design or a game design? Or lighting. Or lighting, or did you notice lighting that could be applied to a game? We're putting the small handful of people who are actually here in person on the spot. Uh. <laughs> Though those of you who are with us on stream, please jump in as well. And yeah. There's a photo out there with this big old plane shooting 
shooting upwards. It made me think of like a fist. So like a superpower that someone in the game would have is this fist flame shooting out. That would be pretty useful. I saw a horse fly. Took a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> it made me think of like. You know, okay. Especially when we all the earlier photos of like the, um, the crawfish mounds. Okay, so I love like miniature, um, miniature world. So not so. It's it kind of sparked a series of ideas. And that's, that's something to keep in mind, too, as you are using observations to impact and, and uh, help, help your artwork and your game design work is uh, we're going to have associations. That's just what happens in our brains. So seeing this bug and then associating it with films or games or movies uh, or TV shows or books that you've you've experienced as well, but then allowing those things to build up as ideas can be really, really um, helpful in coming up with something more interesting than just saying, I want to make something like A Bug's Life. Well, now, now I'm going to go back and observe what other bugs besides those that were in A Bug's Life, or maybe from a different perspective, or maybe um, they have different abilities. And something like a horse fly versus, you know, the little ants are in a bug's life. And, and how might that be different uh, as a character in that kind of a game um, is, is what we're, we're hoping uh, you can kind of would get out of that. Um, so we were hoping to, uh, that you could take a few minutes to draw up some of your designs or write down some notes of a game design that, that you may have come to your mind or um, anything like that. But we also are open for any questions that anyone has at this point as well. Oh, yes, absolutely. So the, the question was, um, any advice we have for converting the real experiences into uh, the, the usable product, into the game design, into the concept art, into the, um, the world building? Um, and Anna, I don't know if I, there was... I, I'm, I can answer that on the D1. Um, I've, I, I've got some answers. I'll let you answer first, and then I can jump in if, if okay. I have anything else. Uh, so I would think that this is, you know, a what, like start doing the what if exercise. Uh, what does it mean? So let's say uh, you see an interesting bug. You go, well, what if this bug was a person? What kind of person would they be? What kind of life would they lead? What specifically do I find interesting about this bug? Well, maybe it's, it's coloring. Where could I use this coloring? Could it make a good uh, palette? Could it be a good outfit? Uh, if this is an outfit for a humanoid character, how would I need to change it in order to fit that character? So try to sort of constantly prod yourself from what you see to the next thing. Um, and along with that, one of the things that we have both found valuable is having someone with whom to discuss those ideas. So going back to the original um, introduction, both of us have created artwork for years. I worked in games for, for years. I've, I've painted for years. Um, but, uh, and I created works that I liked. But it was a really different experience to then be walking with another artist and see something cool. And both of us start weaving tales that, that worked off of each other's ideas. So like the example of the tooth fairy, that, was, that, that developed from both of our brains kind of jumping on that idea and going that same exercise of what if, but then it was what if this, and then 
when the, the other person would be like, yeah, that's really cool, but then what if th this thing instead, or, um, you know, we have dozens and dozens of examples of things like that, watching softball players laying out the, the giant tarp on, on the baseball field to, to protect it, and it looked like from far away as we were walking by the baseball field on campus, the, um, the, the train of a giant gown. Well, I saw that and just thought, oh, that's kind of cool. And then Anna thought, that looks like the, the, tra the train of, and then we started jumping off and I said, like, okay, I can totally see that. But then what if th it wasn't just that the train was unrolling, but it was a character who had a, a whole, um, a whole retinue of, of attendants who had to carry her train with her everywhere she went. And then what would those characters have to look like? And it spun into a whole fantastical tale that was from something as prosaic uh, as baseball players laying out the tarp on the baseball field. So that not, that for me anyway, that never would have happened, evolved that way without another person there to, to talk to. But that doesn't mean that if you don't have someone else to talk to, you can't come up with great ideas from those observations. But maybe instead, having a journal. This is something I encourage everybody to have. Not just a dev journal, but a journal to write down ideas, game design ideas as they come to you. Just keep it with you all the time. On your phone or an actual notebook. Um, I saw this cool thing today, what if this was a game where this happened? So if you wanna be a game designer, having, having the what ifs be about game design building. If you're an artist, what if this were a character? What more could I do with it? What if this was a world? What more could I do with it? And writing, actually writing those things down because you're not gonna remember it in a month or two when you're looking for the next game design idea, but if you've written it down, you will, and then you can, you can expand on it further. And the more you do it, the easier it will become. A, a point like when you can't look at anything without having some ideas. I mean, not so long ago, we have started seeing so, like lone socks on our walks. And that sparked like this whole actually series of stories. We have an animation in mind. We may not ever make it, but we have it designed in our head yeah. <laughs> based off of lost socks that we find on the trail uh, and the stories that we came up with based off of that. So again, keep track of them, do it consistently, and that will help um, spark it regularly um, and, and write down those ideas and sketch out those ideas. If you're an artist, start sketching those ideas. They don't have to be amazing sketches but it's a way of reinforcing um, your thoughts. Okay. Any other questions that anyone has? And if it's not about this, um, about art for games or anything related to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do you keep consistent art style on a project? The same way you keep everything else consistent. You have to have um, someone willing to say this is, this is it. Whether that's a producer or a lead designer, a lead artist, you have to have someone. It, I, I'm all for democracy until it doesn't work. And a, a completely democratic team without anyone willing to, to make the, the tough call is really, really difficult. So having at least a producer, uh, someone in that role to say, this is, this is our style. And then having style sheets. So 
um, some of the examples of what we showed with students having a mood board and having character designs, that's what a mood board is actually, well, that's not what a mood board's for, that's what a character sheet is for, so that you've said, this is my color palette, this is what our lines are gonna look like, this is what our sh basic shapes are gonna look like, and you have that set out so that everyone is supposed to follow that. And you're right, there's still inconsistency. So that's where an art director then comes back in on a project and looks at all of the work and, and brings in the outliers. Um, an example of that, I worked on a game years ago, a Dirty Harry game, and we had all, each of us had built a different, different levels and we brought them together into, well, we built different levels, but we also had all built buildings for a, for a San Francisco city scene, uh, city level, and the buildings didn't match very well. We all had the exact same style sheets to work from. They weren't consistent. Uh, so the art director came in and started with a new palette and said, you have to work th within this palette, and um, these are the things, and he went through each of our work and said these are the things that aren't fitting, these are the things that have to be fixed to make it work. And so overall, that's what it takes, <laughs> is, uh, is someone to say what's not working. And that's so hard for anyone to hear when your work isn't quite right. Um, and that's another thing I suggest for students is toughen up a little bit and be willing to take that critique when when it's not working, because that's why we iterate, that's why we play test, is to fix game design issues and, and to fix art issues and to fix programming issues so that it all comes together into something amazing. Um, any other questions? Does anyone have any design ideas they wanna share with the group before we, uh, before we end? Anything or any cool sketches they came up with from the ex the real experience that they had? Now or that just a, a description? Yeah, just a description of it. We can we Anna and I can talk forever. <laughs> My husband is laughing at me because he knows I can talk forever. <laughs> uh, what? So, so how would so now taking that the next step? How do you see that in a game design? Uh, I would have to say that like maybe a level transition, or uh, maybe help find the extent that if you're about to like maybe pump that up or maybe find a fight pool or something. Like that. Okay, I, I, that, that is an interesting take on the idea of, of level loads, right? Is to, you get the glimpse into the next world um, as a level transition, that could be cool. Or just as a way, a visual cue to know that you're moving into a different type of combat or a different, um, just, just a different part of the level, even if it's not a new level load. Yes, Alice.
And this way, uh, you know, it would make a character more recognizable in the game. This way, even if they're small, even if you just see a silhouette, but they have a distinctive way of moving, you would always recognize them, no matter how little information you have. Any other cool observations? Those of you who are stuck sitting in here, did you take the, the time to look around the room and see anything cool that could, could actually become something involved in a game? Well, since you put me like us on the screen, <laughs> um, so I was looking at this water bottle and I was thinking, hey, you know, it's transparent. Uh, like it could be like a little, kind of like a, a sphere or something that could help guide the player as they continue on with like their like level progression. And uh, it will be like kind of like, you know, they'll be there, but not there. And they can just like easily go from transparent to opaque. So then they can be like, hey, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> or like, oh, hey, you're doing good. Keep on going. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's, and I love, I love when things, you can literally find things anywhere. You're sitting here, you're stuck, you couldn't move around, and you still found something cool to, to notice. Anyone else who was stuck sitting in this room? <laughs> I didn't um, think of anything, but watching and listening to you talk was, um, it reminded me of seeing these things that happen in the industry as well. We talked about the, the dragonfly, and I thought um, that was into a um, animator talked about who worked on the film Dune this past year and talked about the, the, um, the ships that they have. Yeah, and I, sure. I think most good films and books and television shows and games, I mean, they all, again, flights of fancy are going to ha happen, but they, they jump off and fly from, um, from that foundation, and, uh, and they'll do things like that. You may, not, you may not, as the end viewer, recognize the dragonfly qualities in the dune ships, but they, as designers, knew what they were thinking and what um, they were drawn to in that. And that, uh, I think that's great that, to see examples of that. And that's what we really hope um, to encourage in all of you is just take a little more time to look and see and then take that extra step after seeing something cool to think about all of the what ifs, what more could this be, what, how could this um, become something that I want to make. All right, well, thank you everybody who was here with us today. Um, have a wonderful day and enjoy your new real experiences. <laughs> and if you have any questions for us, let us know. <laughs>